Yes, I get, I get called, I, mean, I get to be called Jezebel sometimes. And it's really sad because it says that uh, Jezebel was teaching uh, to eat meat uh, that was given to idols or offered to idols. I don't eat meat. I, I am actually a vegetarian. So I would never teach you to eat meat. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, I get, I get to be called a Jezebel. And then I also get to be called a feminist. And there is a pagan feminism, and I agree that it's very pagan and ugly and bad. Because pagan feminism teaches that women are better than men, and, and women can abort babies. And I don't believe in these things, not at all. But there is Christian feminism, and I don't like to call it feminism at all. I don't like isms. But I like to call it women equality. That's what I call it, equality of women in the Bible, or God's view of a woman who is woman. And it will be very controversial. It's going to be something you usually don't hear in churches at all, very controversial subject. So bear with me till the end, because I try to make, uh, bring you here a lot of study. From my personal study, it was very important for me personally to know how God views me and what I can and cannot do as a Christian. So let my people go so that they may serve me. I believe that we have women today in churches that are silenced, and I call this a spiritual abuse or captivity. They cannot be ordained as ministers, pastors, deacons, elders, etc. They are told they have no spiritual authority. They can teach males the word of God, and in some cases cannot even teach women. But it depends, because it goes from denomination to denomination, from church to church. They decide their own limits. Each denomination has a different limits on women. In some cases, they can't pray aloud in congregation or in the presence of men. Now, I know this is not true in most Christian churches. It was certainly true for me in Watchtower organization. We were not allowed to pray loud. And in the presence of men, not at all. Okay. Now, in some cases, they must wear head covering if handling word of, of God is a sign of submission to men. I know this is not true in many churches. It's mostly true in some pseudo-Christian cults. But it was the case in Watchtower organization. If I was going to say a prayer for some reason, some strange reason, I would have to put on some kind of a head covering in front of everyone so that they know that I'm only a woman and I'm doing something that I'm not supposed to do. They are told to obey their husbands or men in general in everything as the Lord. They are told that husbands or men are priests of the home and they are ordained divinely as such. When I became a Christian, and I heard it actually in, in one Christian church. I went to a Christian church and a pastor who I happened to really like a lot, my brother in Christ, but he said, men, you are the priests of your home. And that was very, very strange for me because as a new Christian, I learned that uh, I, I have to believe in priesthood of all believers. Do you believe in priesthood of all believers? And I considered myself a believer in Jesus, Yeshua, and I was so happy I'm a priest unto God. And I don't have any other mediator other than Yeshua between me and the Father. So that was very strange. I didn't know that there is in the Bible some special ordination of men to be a priest in a home. But anyway, and then they're told that divine role and purpose for women is to be helpmeet to their husbands in a sense that they must keep the house, have children, serve their men. They are told that by obeying and serving their husbands, they are actually serving and obeying God himself. And they are reminded to keep in their place. Like, know your place, like your place. Be happy with, what, with where God puts you. I don't know if you are actually familiar. Maybe some sisters are familiar with that. Maybe some of you never even have to, had to deal with it. I had to personally. And I know a lot of Christian women who did. So this is why I am talking about it. But I would like to introduce to you my captors. These are my ex-captors. These are, um, this, is, 
These are a governing body of Watchtower Society Incorporated, a headquarters in New York. And these are men that were my captors. I was definitely captive to their concept. And I was uh, captive to their way of interpretation of Bible. They have a different Bible than you do. It's called the New World Translation. And men like these, they, they actually translated that Bible. So uh, yes, when, uh, when I came out of organization by amazing miracle, when Yeshua saved me, about a week later, I had two elders in my house on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. And uh, they wanted to talk to me. So I came out and they said to me, well, we only have two questions for you. That's it, two. I said, yes. And they said, do you love Jehovah with all of your heart, mind and soul? And I said, absolutely. I love Jehovah because they call God Jehovah. I said, I love Jehovah. And the second question was, do you believe that governing body of Watchtower Society is a faithful and discreet slave divinely ordained from God? And I said, well, let me tell you this. And I was doing exactly what I saw this man on YouTube to tell me. that Because I was a, such a new, new Christian, I didn't know how to handle the word of God yet very properly. So I said to them, look, I don't know who these guys are. I, I don't know them even by name, and I doubt they know my name. <laughs> but I know one thing, that there is someone up there who knows the number of my hair. <laughs> and I know he knows my name, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. And what they did, And they did, well, thank you very much. We know, and I was an apostate from that day forward. Yay. And Hallelujah. I guess what, I, I'm a happy and proud apostate. <laughs> so anyway, I just told you how Watchtower organizations views women, but is it only in Watchtower? No, it's in many churches here in America. And I just put down few that actually have this kind of a hierarchy, okay? There's Lord, and then there's husband under the Lord, and then wife and children. And I know this seems beautiful. It seemed beautiful to me, because that's what you have in mind. And I know you, you have here in mind Paul's words, and, and, and man is ahead of a woman. And I understand that, so bear with me as we continue. But I also wanted to um, show you that the same problem is in Judaism today. As, as, as we have in Christianity, the same thing is in Judaism. Okay, these are actually, this is organization called Women of the Wall. This is organization in Jerusalem. And these women are literally fighting so they can worship the Lord, <laughs> you know, the same way as men can. They're not allowed to wear certain religious garb. They're not allowed to read the Torah at the wall. Only men can read the Torah. They're not allowed. To, to read Torah, they say there is no way that woman can read Torah. Okay. Jana, in the morning prayers of the Jewish man, he thanks the Lord that he did not make him a woman. Oh, I know that. And you know what? I'm going to have this up soon. <laughs> because we're going to find out, we're going to investigate where did this all come from? How did it creep in even into Christianity? And I did my homework, and you will see, and I hope I have enough time. And <coughs> It, it, it is kind of long, so just tell me if, if I'm too long, if I have to stop. Okay, now in Isaiah 49, I love this scripture, but when you read it in your Bible, you're going to have it completely differently written, okay? But it should read, O woman who publishes good tidings to Zion, get up unto the high mountain, lift up your voice with a shout. O woman who brings good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice, be not afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, your God is here. Amen. These Bible verses mistranslated in English Bible translations, including King James, okay? Which I like King James Version. I'm not here to argue with King James only people. Uh, in Barnes Bible Commentary explains, it is a participle in a feminine gender should read woman or Dora, okay? The commentator supposes that it is applicable to some female whose office 
uh, was to announce glad tidings and says that it was a common practice for females to engage in the office of proclaiming good news. Similarly, another commentary, Clark commentary, says, O daughter that brings glad tidings to Zion, for the office of announcing and celebrating such glad tidings as are here spoken of belong peculiarly to the women on occasion of any great public success a signal of victory or any other joyful event, it was usual for women to gather together to publish and celebrate happy news. Why are they hiding this in the language and translation? Why? Okay, the same thing happened in Psalm 68, 11. I have talked about this in my previous speeches with uh, Brother Begley on his conference, so I didn't want to bring it up. If you can go on YouTube and you can watch my speech, I talk about uh, Psalm 68, 11. But is the silencing of female body of Christ a biblical teaching? You see, Israelites were captives because of their sin, and they're turning away from God. And notice turning away. We're going to come back to the word turned away, okay? So Jeremiah 50, 33 said, This is what the Lord Almighty God said. The people of Israel are oppressed, and the people of Judah as well. All their captors hold them fast, refusing to let them go. Why were they in captivity? because they were in sin and they turned away from God. Christian women have the similar situation today. Because of the fall, because of the sin, they are held captive in churches. Male-only leadership denying them spiritual rights of born-again believers. We have authoritative command in the scripture. Christ told us to do what? Go and make disciples and baptize them. That's his command for all the body of Christ. But in many cases, women are denied this privilege. Jeremiah 9, 6 says, Heaping oppression upon oppression and deceit upon deceit, they refuse to know me, declares the Lord. God does not silence women. These doctrines are based on mistranslation, misrepresentation of scripture, and wrong hermeneutics. Now, hermeneutics is the fancy word for interpretation. Okay, what are the Bible verses that keep women silent? Actually, there are several. I'm going to deal today specifically with three of them. 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 12 through 15. But I suffer not a woman to teach or to assert authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. In the Hebrew scriptures, Genesis 3.16 is the most cited scripture to justify female subordination and defend divinely approved authority of men over women. He says, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Familiar? Okay, there is an abuse of scripture. Scripture in the wrong hands can cause a lot of abuse. And we can see it from the history of slavery in Christian America. Some facts. Churchill, in his book, A History of the English-Speaking People, revealed that 660,000 slaves were held in America by ministers and members of different Protestant denominations. In pulpits, they used Bible to prove that God approves and encourages slavery. They used Old Testament and New Testament scriptures to defend slavery, and they tolerated various prohibitions put on slaves. Slaves couldn't learn to read and write. They had no say in a court of law. They were uh, regarded less than animals and couldn't congregate, and so on and so on. 
Most abolitionists who fought to free slaves were Christians and pastors, that's true. But that doesn't change the fact that many ministers held slaves and defended slavery with scripture. Did you see a movie, 12, 12 Years a Slave? Yeah. Who saw that movie? Do you recall a passage from the movie when a master summoned his slaves in the morning and then he read to them scripture and he was reading to them parable by Jesus when he says a slave who doesn't uh, please his master shall be beaten with many stripes. And he said, many stripes. He said it twice. And he said, that's scripture. Okay? Scriptures used to defend slavery. Notice those scriptures. Psalm 123 too. As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a female slave look to the hand of their mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. Second Ephesians 6, 5. Bond servants, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Titus 2.9 says, Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything. Try to please them, not to talk back to them. In 1 Peter 2.18 we read, Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. Do you like those scriptures? No. Slave owners would read those verses to slaves as a part of worship services to encourage a proper attitude of their slaves and keep them in their place. Based on these isolated verses, the slave owners claimed that Bible supported and encouraged slavery. On the surface, it appears to be true. However, if we examine the entire scripture and evidence, it is not so. In fact, many slaves converted to Christianity because they understood its message of justice and freedom. Paul counseled his followers who were slaves in order to prevent further suffering of Christians, whether slaves are free. Paul couldn't change the whole situation of slavery. He had no power over pagan authorities. So he tried to keep the situation under control best as he could. He certainly didn't teach nor believe that God of Israel divinely ordained slavery nor he preached subjugation of slaves. Notice what Paul really believed and taught, even though these Bible verses were either downplayed or ignored in Sunday churches by pastors who owned slaves. So what did Paul really teach about slavery? In Galatians 3.28, he said, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In 2 Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, he says, And masters do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. In 1 Corinthians 7, 23, what did Paul say? You were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. In Galatians 5, 1, he said, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Paul calls slavery a yoke. He didn't agree with it. How about these scriptures before I read to you? Why did he say these things? Because it was a society he lived in. He had no power to change it. And it was the same thing with women. Women were considered like slaves and less than slaves, perhaps. They had absolutely no rights. They couldn't get education. They couldn't go outside without their husband. Their husbands wouldn't even recognize them in the public. They couldn't speak in the public. And that was actually a law. That's like Sharia. Right. <laughs> Now, what, okay, let's keep going. What Paul really taught about slavery. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.10. 
the sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, notice, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, enslavers are at the same uh, level with liars and sexually immoral. 1 Corinthians 7, 21, were you a slave when called? Do not be concerned about it, but if you can, gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. What the Hebrew scriptures teach about slavery? Scriptures about slavery in Old Testament prove that God tolerated slavery. He tolerated it. And he controlled it to protect the slaves. God allowed human race to practice polygamy, slavery, female subjugation, and other ills, not because these things are divinely ordained, nor because he agreed with those practices. God promised deliverance from these situations, and he promised us justice and redemption, all in the promised seed. It was Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah, who brought us this redemption and freedom from these atrocities practiced by fallen Adam. In Exodus 21, 16, we read, He who kidnaps a man, whether he sells him or he's found in his possession, shall surely be put to death. Jeremiah 34, 9, And each man should set free his male servant, and each man his female servant, and Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, so that no one should keep them, a Jew, his brother, in bondage. Exodus 20.10, when you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in a seventh he shall go out free for nothing. Notice hope, mercy, justice. God controlled slavery, yes, to protect the slave, but he did not ordain it. In Isaiah 58.6, is it not this the fast that I choose? Ask, Lord is asking to lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. In Leviticus 25, 39, if your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. As it, is when, as it went with the slaves, so it goes with the women. Because of wrong hermeneutics, mistranslations, misrepresentations of scripture, and a few isolated Bible verses taken out of proper context, especially in Pauline text, especially in letters of Paul, Christian women in churches are denied their spiritual rights, they are denied their spiritual gifts, and they are made to believe that God of Israel divinely purposed, created, and ordered rule and authority of male over female. What's happening is Adam rules Adam. And in Genesis 5, 2, notice something. God calls woman Adam because he says male and female created he them. And he blessed them and called their name Adam. Woman wasn't Eve. She was named later after fall when Adam already had rulership and authority over her as a result of fall. He renamed her. He gave her a name, Eve, before she was called Adam. All this in Ecclesiastes 8.9, all this I have seen and applied my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun, wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his own hurt. To teach that God has ordained divinely the rulership of Adam over Adam is to teach directly against scripture. For God has declared that the dominion and rulership is given to both. Male Adam and female Adam, and it is not a dominion over one another. Notice in Genesis 1, 27, 28, so God created man. Adam means humankind, male, in he not male in Hebrew, but human, okay? So God created a man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the every living thing that moves upon the earth. 
It is crucial to understand that God has not commanded Adam to rule and have dominion over his wife or vice versa, wife over the husband, but that the dominion and rulership was given to both. And over what? Over the fishes of the sea, the birds of the air, over the every living thing that moves upon the face of the earth. Okay, so we're going to uh, Genesis 3.16. I'm supposed to read it, but I only have one hand. So let me see. And I already read it today. To the woman he said, I'll greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now did you know that this particular verse is referenced to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 34-35? as a law, that's, that's actually in translation, when you're looking at 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35, you have a little note next to there, and it says Genesis 3, 16, go there, because of this verse, the doctrine of silencing women started it, because of Genesis 3, 16. There are several, particularly three, mistranslations in one single verse that distort God's statement about women. Reputable Hebrew scholar, Mrs. Bush, Catherine Bushnell, by the way, she was outstanding Hebrew and Greek scholar and a medical doctor. She had dual degree. She studied ancient languages of Hebrew and Greek and she was a medical doctor. Catherine Bushnell explained in her book, God's Word to Women, in paragraph 117. Behold, that verse 16 should have been rendered. Unto the woman he said, A snare has increased thy sorrow. The word snare being literally, literally rendered a lying in wait. Instead, it is rendered, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. What is the difference here? Is there a difference? The difference between the two renderings in Hebrew is in an interlinear vowel sign. Now, H-A-R-B-E-H, -E and I put it in red for you, H-R-B, and then vowels are added in between. In, in, in between, an A-A-R-B-E-H, Arabe Araba, did I say that right? Yes. Okay, literally meaning multiplying, I will multiply, and notice H-I-R-B-A-H-A-O-R-E-B, -E literally has cause to mu multiply a lying in wait, verb is before nominative. Notice that the capital letters by itself constitute the original text. Okay, H-R-B-A-R-B. -R -R this is original text because vowels didn't exist in Hebrew. They were not there. There were no punctuations. There were not even spaces. It was just like a bunch of letters next to each other. No vowels, okay? The form A-R-B occurs 14 times in the book of Joshua and the book of Judges, where it is translated properly as ambush or lying in wait, which is Satan, the devil. So they translated this word properly in Joshua and the book of Judges, but improperly in Genesis 3.16, same word. Bashnell explains in her book, that the scribes took four consonants, A, H, V, J, and inserted them into text to indicate the vowel sounds. Moreover, the insertion of these vowel letters didn't prove sufficient. Then as late as 600 to 800 AD, a whole system of vowel signs was added, most elaborately indicating the vowels of each word as tradition has preserved it. These vowel signs were interline interlinear and therefore did not confuse the text as did the vowel letters. This is the word in Hebrew. 
This is analysis. This is the word we have in Genesis 3.16, Arab, Araba. And even it shows the origin and the root and the definition. Look at the definition. To do what? To lie in wait, to ambush. It doesn't say, I will multiply your sorrow and thy conception. Not in Hebrew. It says, snare has caused you sorrow. Snare. Who is the snare? Devil. He did this to you. Not God. Okay? So here we go. This is how we have it. Unto the woman, he said, I have greatly increased thy sorrow. You see, HRB, ARB? How it should be in Hebrew. Unto the woman, he said, A snare has increased thy sorrow. HRB, ARB. Same exactly a Hebrew word, completely mistranslated. Snare has increased thy sorrow. Rendering appears to fit the character of God and the context of entire chapter of Genesis account. God is not the cause of sorrow. Satan is. I will greatly increase your sorrow would indicate that it is God who is inflicting great sorrow upon Eve. This verse would contradict biblical truth stated in Lamentation 3.33 where it says, for he, God, does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. Or it would contradict the truth stated in Job 37, 23, where it says, the Almighty is beyond our reach and exalted in power in his justice and great righteousness. He does not oppress. He is not the cause of oppression. I will great, greatly multiply thy sorrow would contradict the context of Genesis account. Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Just one text before 3.16 and 3.15, he is telling that woman is the enemy of Satan. He is putting her on the correct side of the equation. An enemy of Satan is who? Friend of God. God has put Eve on his side. He said, she's on my side, and I am going to work through her, because through her seed shall come Messiah. So after he puts the woman on his side, do you think now he's going to turn away to her? He's going to turn to her and say, well, now I just put you on my side. You are my friend, and Satan is your enemy, but I will multiply your sorrow. <laughs> okay. No, it was the snare, the ambush, the lying in wait, a loser. He caused her that sorrow. He deceived her. Second mistranslation, thy, con thy conception. You watch out, sis. I won't talk to you about that one. All right, correct spelling for the Hebrew word conception would be H-R-J-W-N. It is correctly spelled and translated as H-R-J-W-N, as a conception, in Ruth 4.13 and Hosea 9.11. In Genesis 3.16, the Hebrew word HRN is incorrectly translated as conception. This incorrect translation of the word conception appears only in the Bible once, and it is Genesis 3.16. Hebrew scholars and lexical authorities say that HRN as rendered in Genesis 3.16 is erroneous translation. The word HRN is translated correctly in Septuagint. If you go to Septuagint, you will find the correct translations from Hebrew, and it is the sighing, not conception. Third mistranslation, desire. And you shall desire your husband, and he shall rule over you. Teshukwa or teshuka means to turn to is derived from the verb shuk, which translates as to run or to run repeatedly to someone. The word is incorrectly translated as desire. 
longing. And I have to tell you this, in older translations, old, old King James and Geneva Bible, it actually, they translated it as lust. You shall lust after your husband and he shall rule over you. Well, that's not what the word says at all. Okay, Septuagint is a version where, um, oh, okay, okay, the word is incorrectly translated as desire longing and in English Bibles, but correctly translated in Septuagint as turning to. Septuagint is a version where Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek. Jesus himself and the apostles used the Septuagint. The Pentateuch of Septuagint is highly esteemed for its accuracy, and this translation renders the shuka in Greek as apostrophe, which, is, which means to turn away or later to turn to. Septuagint is a translation done by 72 Jewish scholars in Alexandria in about 285 BC. The same word teshuka was translated as turning in some other ancient sources, such as Syriac Peshita. We have a Samaritan version of that old Latin Bible, about 8200, Coptic Sahidic Bible, Coptic Buharic Bible, the Ethiopic version of the Bible. Uh, these ancient versions of translations deny that Eve was under a curse of God, but rather Eve was turning away from her God and turning to her husband, but as a consequence, he will now rule over her. The question here is, where did the idea to translate a shukha as desire or lust came from Genesis 3.16? Where did it all start? Talmud. Talmud is the answer. Talmud is definitely not a valid translation of Hebrew text. It is rather a compilation of Jewish traditions or oral law. Talmud pronounced ten curses upon Eve, and the fifth, sixth, and ninth of these curses supply the sense of lust or a desire for the word teshukha. How did the word desire or lust in Geneva Bible get into English versions? Okay, outstanding Hebrew scholar Mrs. Boschno pinned down an Italian Dominican monk named Pagnino, who translated the Hebrew Bible into English in the year of 1528, who decided to neglect an ancient versions of scripture to attain himself to the teachings of rabbis. He rendered the word teshukha as lust, copying it from the Talmud, and he influenced every older English versions in their translation, and therefore you can find the word desire in all of our Bibles and the word lust in all Geneva translation. Jeremiah 8.8 8 was fulfilled. How can you say we are wise, for we have the law of the Lord, but actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely. Summary of mistranslations in Genesis 3.16. Genesis 3.16 is not a curse put on women that God has divinely ordered. It is a prophecy of a sad consequence of sin. Adam sinned willfully and as a fallen man who lost his relationship with God will now rule over a woman, his wife, who will turn to him for her needs. She also lost relationship with her Abba, Daddy, and she in her sinful state will turn for her needs to her husband who is physically stronger instead of turning to God. This prophecy has fulfilled on a worldwide scale women have been ruled over in a most harsh way in heaven societies and sadly due to misrepresentation and mistranslation of scripture woman has not found a healing even in a Christian circles where she is subjugated and silenced as Israelites she turned away from God and therefore suffered captivity and here I have put for you uh, all of these uh, ancient versions of the Bible the shuka is everywhere turning and note is over here do you see the Babylonian Talmud on the bottom? For the very first time, there was Jewish rabbis, Jewish men, that translated it as lust. Before then, every single translation had it as turning.
Okay, ten curses were uttered against Eve in Babylonian Talmud. First one, they took it from Genesis 3.16 and they changed it. I greatly multiply refers to catamenia, the monthly cycle. So then so your, your sorrow in rearing children, your in thy conception. Number four, in sorrow you shall bring forth children. Number five, the Babylonian Talmud say, thy lust shall be unto your husband. And it's followed by such foul language that I couldn't put it in here. Number six was, he shall rule over thee. There was more fouler language after that in the Talmud. Number seven, she is wrapped up like a mourner. M mourner, I don't know how to say that properly. Okay, number eight, dares not appear in public with her head uncovered. Number nine, is restricted to one husband while he may have many wives. So they started polygamy, okay? Now, number 10, and is confined to the houses to a prison. Now, you see a picture of Jesus. What is he? Does he look happy? No. Your traditions, Talmud, make the Father's law of no, none effect, okay? So here we go. Correct reading and interpretation of Genesis 3.16. I underlined three mistranslated words in that one verse. Talmudic influence, as it is in our Bible, sadly. But true word of God says this. And to the woman he said, The snare, Satan, has increased thy sorrow and thy sighing. In sorrow you shall bring forth sons. I'm talking about literal translation. He said you shall bring forth sons and you will turn to your husband, but he will rule over you. Now, Pain here is not about physical childbirth pain. You see, God foreknew that she's going to have sorrow in her heart in childbearing. Why? Because one of her sons will kill the other. Not because it, it's painful to give birth. We have a epidural. And it's painful for men to also... <laughs> Also, it's, it's painful for men to have a kidney stone. <laughs> so, <laughs> women must find healing in a person of Jesus Christ. The glorious gospel of Yeshua sets the captives free. Gospel reinstates women to a position of equality with men as it was in the beginning in a garden of Eden. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And what did in Luke chapter 10 verse 42, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Amen? Do you remember how Martha was worried about everything? Do we have enough food? Do we have this, this, this cookie, sandwiches, everything? Because we have to serve Jesus and men coming here. Mary didn't help her at all. She just wanted to be with Christ and at his feet, and she wanted to listen to every word. And what did he say? Martha, you just worry too much and leave Mary alone. She chose the better part. And it will be not taken away from her. No more housework. <laughs> we do the housework together. All right, let's. Do I have time? I, I, I have a lot of analysis of these three verses I read you that are used against women. So, analysis of 1 Corinthians. All right, I'll be fast. Analysis of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, 35. Women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to learn anything, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in a church. It is important to know that the verse 34, 35 in a chapter I followed by verse 36 that seems to be as a rebuke or disagreement with verse 34, 35. It follows, what? Came the word of God out from you or came it to you only? And the verse 38 states, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. 
the chapter 14 of Corinthians was written by Paul to Corinthians. We do not have letters written to Paul in our possession. Although this particular letter was written as an answer to a letter that was originally sent to Paul first. We do not have these letters that would clarify exactly what problems was Paul dealing with. But in this particular case, we have Greek manuscripts where the verse 34, 35 are not part of actual letter that Paul wrote. Instead, they appear either as an addition at the end of the chapter 14 or even on a margin below, as you can see. In this ancient manuscript, you can see verse 34, 35 on the very bottom. See that? Okay. Reputable Bible scholars are aware that the verse 34, 35 are not Pauline words. They're not the words of Paul. But they are quotations from the letter that was written to Paul. Paul is answering the concern of Judaizers. Many Jews coming to faith in Christ were stumbled over the fact that women were praying and prophesying freely during gatherings and the Jewish oral law prohibited women from speaking in gatherings where men were present. But perhaps the most amazing proof that those verses were not written by Paul comes from the text itself. Notice the reference to a certain law in the text. For they are not permitted to speak as the law says. What law is Paul speaking here? What law? Would Paul make a reference to a law that doesn't exist in a Torah? Would Paul have the authority to make up some kind of a new law that was not in existence in Torah, that didn't originate with God? Wasn't Paul trying to get people out of the law instead of reminding them of some kind of law that supposedly silences women and declares their voice a shame? Now, when I say out of the law, I'm not talking about divine Torah law, Ten Commandments. That's a given law forever, perpetually, never ending. This law is on the tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And they will never change. I am talking about this all kinds of 613 laws or what kind of law that is a reference to a law law says that the women have to be silent what law if the law that silences women in a torah actually existed paul would make a clear reference to this divine unchanging law just as he referenced the law from the ten commandments in a letter to ephesians chapter 6 1 2 3 that's where paul said children obey your parents in the lord for this is right honor your father and your mother which is the first commandment with the promise i mean he's telling you what law he's citing right so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth Paul is very familiar with Torah. But where is the law about women that their voice is a shame? Okay, but in a case of the law referred to in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, Paul is not explaining us where this law is. There is no law in a Torah that silences women. You will not find this kind of law anywhere. Not in the Ten Commandments, not in the other 613 laws given by Moses. Nowhere in the Torah, God said that the voice of woman is a shame, that they can't speak in assembly, that they must ask questions, their husbands at home. Talmud. The law is in a Talmud. We can surely find this law that silences women and declares their voice a shame in the Talmud. It was an oral law of Jews that prohibited women from speaking in assembly. Even from studying and reading the Torah, women couldn't participate in spiritual life. And all they could do if they wanted to know something from Torah is ask their husbands questions in the privacy of home, whether their voice would not be heard among men. Woman was a captive, declared to be a prisoner in a house, and she was not to speak in public where men were present. This is the law referenced in 1 Corinthians verse 34. Verses 34-35 are not the words of Paul, who was himself an ex-Pharisee, and he very well knew the oral law that they quoted to him. He knew that this law was a tradition of men, and he rebuked these men in a verse 36 and asserted that if they are ignorant, they will stay ignorant. For did the word God of God came only through men? How about Hulda? How about Deborah? How about Esther? 
How about all these women that spoke God's laws and, and spoke for God as prophetess? Right. So I, I have put for you over there all these attitudes uh, about women in the time of Jesus. And yes, they were praying. And they're praying even today that they're thanking God that they're not a woman. So it all originates from Talmud, and unfortunately, this is not taught properly in churches, and they're actually teaching Talmud in your church. I, some, somebody does it from ignorance, and somebody does it, uh, maybe they know, but I just don't know why is this happening. Um, by the way, I just wanted to tell you that this, this is not only in the first Corinthians chapter 14 that Paul uses quotations. This is common for Paul. Sometimes you might think that you know that something Paul said and he didn't even say that. C can you read to me first Corinthians chapter 6, 12? It just kind of came to me. Chapter 6, verse 12. I have only one hand. It's very hard for me to do this. But Sister Lisa. I love it. <laughs> I got her. I got it. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought Okay, that's enough. You think Paul said that? He didn't. He said, all things are lawful unto me. That wasn't his words. He's quoting. He's quoting from letter he got. And then he's answering the quotation. It's just that they don't say it in your Bible. They just write it up as all one words of Paul, and they don't distinguish between quotations and not quotations. Paul didn't say, all things are lawful for me. He answered them. He quotes them. OK, you're saying in your letter, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are advantageous. These are his words, you understand? But not all things are lawful for me. OK, but let's keep moving. Moreover, Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. The language here is inclusive in both genders in Greek language. Paul is encouraging believers, men and women, to prophesy. The gift of prophecy in the New Testament was not the same gift of prophecy as in old times, Old Testament times. Paul has clarified for us what prophesying in New Testament means. He said, but he or she, because the gender uh, is inclusive, you would see it in Greek, you don't see it in your Bible because they put he, because they made their default gender male in, in English Bibles. But in Greek, you would see that it's inclusive. It's humans, anthropos, anyone. But he or she who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comforts men or women. He who speaks in tongues defiles himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you prophesied. And he's saying it to women in the same chapter. Is he schizophrenic? <laughs> I mean, you're telling me, Paul, over here that I am, you wish I prophesy, but here you're telling me, don't even speak in, in assembly. OK, so for he or she who prophesies is greater than he or she who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he she interprets that the church may receive edification. Prophesying in a church is a gift of teaching and preaching to the believers uh, in church for the purpose of edification, and Paul said that his wish is that we all prophesied. So the question is this, are we to follow Talmudic laws or God's laws? Why are we still teaching Talmud in churches? Are the words of Apostle John 8, 36 part of your life? If the Son therefore shall make you free, you will be free indeed. Jesus made us free from the traditions of men, so let's grab that freedom. Okay, let's go quickly to analysis of 1 Timothy 2.12. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority of a man. She must be quiet. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority of a man, she, uh, but to be in silence. I put it in both translations, NIV and KGV, just to see how they render it. The question is this. Does Greek text speak of one specific woman or just any generic faceless woman? 
Okay, we need to look into the Greek language. Again, we are dealing here with a one side of conversation type of scenario. We do not possess letters of Timothy that he wrote to Paul. I see it as a major mistake during canonization process for the fact that we are indeed missing letters that Paul received is leaving us with the danger of false interpretation of Paul's words, which I believe we are victims of in a case of 1 Timothy 2.12. If Timothy's letters were not included in a canon of scripture as we know it today, they should at least be made available to us. I am afraid that this wish of mine is in vain as I believe that these letters are in the secret chambers of Vatican and for a good reason. In churches and seminaries, these words written to Timothy by Paul are decoded as a universal prohibition of spiritual authority for female body of Christ. We are told that Christian women in general can't teach scripture, can hold various offices of spiritual responsibility, and in general that women cannot teach men, followed by reasons given for this prohibition, which is for the man was first formed and a woman and she was deceived, etc. But thank me to our God, we have letters of Paul, and from these letters, if we are paying attention, we can decode the more appropriate meaning of 1 Timothy that would bring us closer to real truth. Before we are going to analyze 1 Timothy 2.12 in depth, it is vital to know that the 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus are designated as pastoral epistles. This is how they are referred to in a biblical seminaries. I and some outstanding Bible scholars disagree with this designation. Timothy was not a pastor. He was not an elder. Titus was not a pastor, and he was not an elder. Apostle Paul left them at various places to assist churches. They were apostolic assistants. And in 2 Timothy 4.5, Paul says to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. They were evangelists. They were not pastors of uh, church. Okay, and I, I'm not just making this up. I really studied this very deeply, and I, I, there is a body of Christ. There are scholars, and they truly disagree with the designation that these are pastoral epistles. Okay, now one biblical scholar called Frank Viola said. Labeling 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus as pastoral epistles is a misnomer. These letters were not given this label until 18th century. Until then, they were not called that. Okay? Timothy and Titus were not pastors. They were apostolic workers. It is after the designation of pastoral epistles that arrived in 18th century that these epistles were used as a creed or a certain law book for pastors where all the rules are how Christians are to behave, like female Christians who are supposedly, according to instruction in pastor epistles, not supposed to teach men. The question is, why did Paul write to Timothy this letter? Paul himself answers my question in 1 Timothy 1, 3 through 4. Please pay attention to everything here. It's very crucial that you do. Paul says, as I urged you upon my departure to Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus in order that you may instruct certain persons to neither teach differently nor to pay attention to myths and unending genealogies, which stir up questions rather than furthering the stewardship of God in faith. As we see, Paul left Timothy at Ephesus to combat false teachers who were spreading different myths. Timothy dealt with a specific situation in Ephesus where various false teachers infiltrated congregations of God and were teaching myths and genealogies that were false. Paul had, has said to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.20, he says that among the false teachers are Hymenaeus and Alexander. These were two males, okay, to whom the Paul has handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. So we have a problem in Ephesus, huge problem. There are false teachers, and Timothy is writing a private letter to Paul, and he's complaining. I have him and those, I have Alexandra, I have this woman here who is teaching these myths and genealogies and they're coming to our congregations. This is what Paul is saying. This is what's happening in Ephesus. 
okay? Apparently, among the false teachers was a certain woman, which I don't believe she was baptized woman in Christ because Paul always referred to female body of Christ as my sisters and by name, by the way. He wouldn't, we had a Paul here, he wouldn't say, hi, woman. He would say, hello, sister Lisa, my co-worker in Christ's gospel. Okay, what was the situation in Ephesus? This is so important that you know this. This question can be answered from the book of Acts, chapter 19, 27, 29. Paul was in Ephesus preaching when a riot broke out. Acts reads, not only is there danger that this trade of ours falling to disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis be regarded as worthless, and that she whom all Asia and the world worship will even be dethroned from magnificence. And when they heard this and were filled with rage, they began crying out, saying, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion, and they rushed with one accord into the theater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. Ephesian economy depending on selling of icons of great goddess Diana, which is Diana in Rome, but in Ephesus she was called Artemis. There were the same goddess, different name. There was a temple of Diana in Ephesus that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So we see that Timothy was left in Ephesus where he dealt with a very specific problem of infiltration of congregations by false teachers who promoted false doctrines of Diana, Artemis. Ephesus was a center of false pagan cultic worship. In English KGV Bible, the 1 Timothy 2.12 reads, I suffer not a woman. It sounds as a command in English, but not so in the original Greek text. In Greek, there is no imperative form here. Instead, there is a simple present tense. I should read as I am not now permitting a woman and a certain woman, that woman, Timothy was well aware that there were Christian women as co-laborers with Paul and Christian women freely prayed and prophesied and preached in churches. Priscilla told Apollos, Timothy would never understand this prohibition about this one woman as a universal prohibition for all Christian sisters in all churches of God. It was not Paul's habit to put restrictions on sisters in Christ as we saw previously that he encouraged them all to pray and prophesy. And I explained to you that prophesying in New Testament meant actually preaching. When Paul says, I am not now permitting a woman, he follows with a neither nor construction uh, that involved two infinitives. In Greek, it's didaskein, to teach, and authentain, to dominate. One Bible scholar of Greek named Philip Payne explained that these two infinitives correlate together as goal for a purpose, or goal or a purpose. Obviously, some woman in Ephesian church was teaching with a goal of dominating a man, but the doctrine she was teaching was false. How do I know this? There is only one single use of the word authentain in the New Testament, and it is in Timothy 2.12. And it translates in English Bibles as have authority over a man. So in English Bible, the Greek word authentain is translated as have authority over the man, okay? But the word authentain in Greek doesn't have the meaning of exercising authority of someone. The word meaning in English would be to restrain, to control in a domineering way, even in a murderous way. The word authentain in classical Greek meant even don't murder someone, don't yell, bark, scream, in that kind of a way, okay? Okay. Um, literature in the first century, authentain expressed idiomatically, it meant to shout orders or to bark at somebody, scream, yell. So there is absolutely no excuse for translating this word as to have authority over. 
So the proper way to express First Timothy 2.12 would be, I am not now permitting a woman to teach with violent barking, shouting at a man. Obviously, there was a woman in a congregation meeting shouting and violently screaming at a certain man, perhaps her husband, because that's what Greek says. I'm, I'm reading you Greek here. It says, I don't permit her now to shout, shout and bark her orders at this man. And it's a particular woman to a particular man, okay? So the Greek, authentic, shouting orders, barking at someone, screaming with violence for purpose of complete domination, even a murder. That's the meaning of the word. It's used in Bible only once, and it's used in Timothy, right there, one time. There is a historical proof that the word authentic could be translated as a person having regular or spiritual authority over someone. There is no historical proof for that. The word for this would be exousia, as used in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. When somebody has authority over somebody in the Bible, in Greek language, you use the word exousia. And Paul said it in a Corinthians where he says that a man doesn't have uh, the woman doesn't have authority, exousia, over her own body, but her husband does. But likewise, the man doesn't have authority over his body, but his wife does. So there is a mutual authority that Paul is teaching, okay? Now, the First Timothy 2.12 translation is misleading and false. Now, how do I know that the woman in Ephesian church was screaming false doctrine of Artemis? Well, of course, I even studied what Artemis believed. What did they believe? Okay. Uh, there is a quotation I do not uh, of First Timothy. I wrote it down because uh, it doesn't. They don't only teach you in churches that you have no authority over a man, that you cannot teach a man. But they're saying why, right? Paul says, "For Adam was from." first formed than Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, and propriety. In this passage, Paul is not saying that woman can teach a man or she can have spiritual authority over a man because man was formed first and she was formed second, for she was created together with man. God called them Adam, remember? Or because woman is a sinner and deceived one, and Adam was not deceived, therefore he's a better candidate for teaching. For Paul clearly said in the book of Romans, that through one man, Adam, sin entered the world. So man is also a sinner. Paul is not trying to say that woman will be saved by having children. Some churches would have you believe. To understand what Paul is saying here, we must study what Timothy dealt with in Ephesus. He dealt with the cult of Diana and false teachers that infiltrated congregation teaching Diana's falsehood. Paul was correcting here false doctrines. What false doctrines? Artemis cult was a female only cult, the temple of Artemis called Diana, was a massive structure which dominated area in Ephesus. The priests were all women. She was a female deity. Women ruled in that cult, and they dominated men. When Paul said, and Adam was formed first, he refuted false belief in the Artemis cult that taught that pagan gods, Zeus and the Leto, had twins, and a female came first. Artemis originated before Apollo. The Apollo cult dominated the Greek world at the time, so there was a competition between the Artemis cult and Apollo cult worshippers. This explains why Paul stressed that Eve sinned and was deceived, because Artemis cult taught that female was created first and she was enlightened and without sin. Artemis cult taught that woman was superior to man. We had this problem in Ephesus where it was a matriarchy instead of patriarchy, and women were literally domineering and ruling men and preaching genealogies. They were preaching that women came from a special warrior female, and they were created first, and they were enlightened, and, and women never sinned. It was a cult of Diana. And this is what Timothy is dealing with in Ephesus, you see? So Paul is setting things straight, right? He's saying, no, no, no. 
Artemis was a fertility goddess. Women believed that Artemis protected them during pregnancy and childbirth. It was believed that she was a mother goddess and source of life and had a fertility power in nature. Young women turned to her for protection of their virginity. Barren women prayed to her for being able to conceive and women in labor turn, turned to her for help. So Apostle Paul was setting things straight as opposition to the certain one woman who was teaching with violent behavior false doctrines of Diana because it was man who was first formed, not woman, and woman was not enlightened and sinless, but she did sin and was deceived. And if the woman will be safe, singular, there's a singular woman in Greek, will be safe, not saved during childbirth if they continue in faith, love, and holiness. 1 Timothy 2, 12 through 15 is a not prohibition code for all Christian women never to assume spiritual authority, but the principle of this scripture is that neither male nor female teacher can preach falsehood. That's what we should learn from this. We cannot teach falsehood, and we cannot teach in a violent, domineering way with the goal of getting her or his way. That's the only lesson here. Okay, so the evidence I have presented to you today suggests that traditional understanding of Genesis 3.16, 1 Corinthians 14, and Timothy 2.12 rests on a shaky assumption and some very fundamental mistranslations and misunderstandings about what the Bible actually teaches about women. Difficulties in these texts are often belittled or ignored. Bible texts that teach biblical equality are so belittled and glossed over, as in the case of slaves, some isolated Bible verses taken out of proper context are cited to keep women in their place. When Ecclesia began on the day of Pentecost, the very thing Peter mentioned was male and female prophesying. The Holy Spirit fell on both genders equally, and they both didn't keep quiet, but assumed their God-given authority to speak for God. We believe that those who silence Christian women are guilty of sin and perpetuate, perpetuate false teachings. And I know that this is kind of really strong message, but I really believe that Bible teaches biblical equality. And when we say, okay, what is the spiritual authority? When you, as a man or a woman, when you have a spiritual authority, do you have authority over some person? Do you know where your authority lies? Because Jesus said where, what we have authority over. Jesus said... Yes, he said that we have authority of a devils and yeah. evil spirit and we have authority of a disease and illness and we can raise the dead. We have authority even over death. But we never have authority over another human being, man or a woman. And when you are a minister of God, you to be lost and wash the feet of all of your people in a church. Amen. Because what did Jesus say? Whoever wants to be first let him be very last and a servant of all. Right? So when they say that women cannot teach men or they cannot speak for God, you're telling me women cannot serve? Women cannot be last and a servant of all? Of course we can be last. We want to be last and we want to be servants of all. And we want to wash your feet. And we want to serve you and show you what God showed us. And I say that you women are free in Christ and you grab that freedom. And if God calls you, He gives you a gift, you take it. And you obey God rather than man. But I tell you, be careful. Don't ever misuse this gift that you would think that you're higher than your spouse. Because we are not higher than men but we are equal to men. We are male and female in his image. Amen? Okay. I know it's my time is over.